wonderful to be here on this beautiful Sunday. The sun shining. Everything seems to be in its natural order this morning. There are some mornings we get up and everything just seems to be perfect. We hear the birds singing. And you just have this feeling of well-being. And as I got up this morning, I had this wonderful feeling. I remember Psalm 122, verse 1, one of my favorites, where it said, I was glad when they, you people, the Christians, said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. So here we are this morning in VCBCC, and it's always an honor to be allowed by God to come to this altar. It's a privilege. The world outside doesn't see it as a privilege, but we do, and I certainly do. Because if I go back even 20 years ago, I would never have thought that I would be standing at an altar promoting God's word and defending God's word. So here I am. At that time, I was more into just my life, what I can get from life. And then the Holy Spirit worked in me and said, your life will be changed and you'll spend your life promoting God's word and defending his word. So now I have a reason for life, whereas before it was just a selfish life. So praise God that he has allowed me to be an ambassador for his word. Because his word is under attack today. It has always been under attack since the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden. Uh, and today we see it all around the world. There is a sustained attack relentless on his word and on his church. And things are not going to get better. According to the book of Revelation, things are going to get a lot worse. Your children and their children are going to be persecuted a lot more than even we are today. We are in a battle, a spiritual warfare, and we have to stand firm. We are his representatives, and there's only a few of us. But if God and if Christ be for us, then who can be against us? Let us pray before we do our gospel preaching this morning. Heavenly Father, we are going to speak this morning about being your excellent servant. And Heavenly Father, may you bless us to be that excellent servant as we live in this dark, fallen world. It's not easy, Father. We are surrounded on all sides. So may you give us spiritual wisdom, give us strong faith, Give us courage to be that loyal and humble servant, to serve your church and to serve your word, Father God. And we ask this great blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, our text this morning is from the book of Timothy, chapter 1, verses 6, 7, and 8. And I'm going to read verses 6, 7, and 8, and then we're going to go deep in it to find out what does Paul mean by an excellent servant? How can we be an excellent servant? What does it involve? What must I do to be an excellent servant? It's one of the things that Paul is talking to Timothy about, to be an excellent servant. So we'll read... Verses 6, 7, and 8, and the heading is, A Good Servant of Christ Jesus. Verse 6, now this is Paul writing his letter to Timothy. If you explain these things to the brothers and sisters, Timothy, you will be a worthy servant of Christ Jesus, one who is nourished by the message of faith and the good teaching that you have followed. Do not waste time arguing over godless ideas and old wives' tales. Instead, train yourself to be godly. Physical training is good, 
but training for godliness is much better. Promising benefits in this life and in the life to come. Now, I'm going to concentrate on certain things in that verses 6, 7, and 8. One of them is you are to be godly, Timothy. You are to have a life of godliness. You are to train. And then he talks about physical exercise. So I'm going to spend a lot of time concentrating on godly and godliness. What exactly do those terms mean? Now the background to this is that this letter was written to Timothy in 65 AD. And Paul and Timothy were very good friends. They had journeyed together to different countries, different cities. So Paul knew Timothy very well. Now Paul had been in Ephesus. This is where Timothy now is. He's writing the letter to Timothy. Timothy is in Ephesus. That's a city in Turkey. Today we call that country Turkey. But at that time it was not called Turkey. It was called Asia Minor. So here it is Paul. He was in Ephesus. Paul has now left Ephesus. And now he's writing to Timothy who is in Ephesus. And he's saying to him, Timothy... I want you, this is a pastoral letter, we call it a pastoral letter. The, the Roman Catholic priests on a Sunday, they have these pastoral letters. So what is a pastoral letter? Well, this is a pastoral letter where he's saying to Timothy, uh, Timothy, I want to guide you spiritually. It is a letter of spiritual guidance to Timothy. Now, spiritual guidance about what? About the church. Timothy would be having fellowship. Now, they didn't have a church like we have a church today. They had house, a house church, and they'd have fellowship in each other's houses. So he's writing this letter, a pastoral letter to Timothy, saying, Timothy, listen up here, be aware. Here's a letter I'm writing to you, giving you spiritual guidance concerning your church, your house church, with your fellowship with your Christians. And I want to point out certain things in my letter about spiritual guidance to protect the church, take care of the church. They are the flock and you are the shepherd and they're the sheep. So I'm giving you spiritual guidance, Timothy, how to protect your church. And then he also in his letter is saying, Timothy, it's about you also. I want you also, not just your church, but you also have a responsibility for your own life. So it's not that you're okay, Timothy, and it's only the people in your church. No, it's you too, Timothy. I want to give you spiritual guidance that you too are going to be a responsible leader, a responsible Christian for your church. Now, the age of Timothy, he was around 35 to 38 years of age, a relatively, relatively young man. Paul was much older. Paul was around 60 years of age. So that is the background. Now, I'm going to spend quite a lot of my sermon on this idea of godliness. Because we can throw out these words and you can go home and say, well, Brother Dennis never explained what godliness is. So I'm going to tell you what it means to be godly. Now that word godly... Let's make it very simple. Godly means reverence. So when Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, I want you to continue on to be a godly man. It means reverence or respect. Now, I prefer the word reverence because it's more powerful than just respect. Reverence is more powerful, more deeper. So if we are to be godly, it means we are to have reverence for God. So that's what godly means. Now, it's difficult to be godly in this day and age. It's difficult to live a life of godliness. So I'm not going to make this easy. I'm not going to make it romantic. Oh, I'm a Christian. I want to be godly. All romantic, easy. No. To be godly is very, very difficult in the times we live in. 
because the world outside is our enemy and they are not interested in godly people and godliness. They want to crush the church. Now, godliness is walking with God. Now remember in the Bible in Genesis 3, there was a man called Enoch. You all know Enoch. And it said about Enoch, Enoch walked with God. It said Enoch, he pleased God. Now there is a godly man. He walked with God. He pleased God. And of course he got a mighty reward. Enoch was taken up to be with God in heaven. Now we're not taken up. We die and we go to the grave. But Enoch. His walk with God was so powerful. And so great that God. Took him up. Into heaven. He pleased God. That is in Genesis 5. Now godly means. Godliness means someone who is. Devoted to. To God. Their whole life is devoted to God. God and His Word is the centerpiece of their life. Their whole focus day after day is on God, the Bible, His Word, knowing His Word, defending His Word. They don't look left, they don't look right, they just are focused straight ahead. On God. All they see is God. The godly man looks at God. He wants to please God. He's not interested in the world around him. People are doing this and that. He doesn't care about the world around him. Godliness is an attitude. Now, some Christians, they want to have feelings. Godliness has nothing to do with feelings. You see, a lot of particularly immature Christians, baby Christians, they want to have come to the church and have feelings. It's nothing to do with feelings. Godliness is an attitude and it results in action. Whereas many who go to the church, they want to go to a church that's exciting, that has exciting music where they jump up and down and they come and they go home and they said, I love that church because it makes me feel good. I have emotions, but there's nothing inside really. They don't really know the word of God. They don't defend the word of God. So we're not a church that wants to have emotional feelings, getting carried away with emotional feelings. It is an attitude. Attitude. And that attitude results in action. Now, this attitude has three essentials. One, love of God. Two, fear of God. Three, desire for God. And that is the attitude. My attitude, love for God, fear of God, desire, a, a, a huge, strong desire for God, to know God. Who is my God? What is his character? What does he represent? And to be honored that you are even an ambassador for God out of the 8.5 billion people in the world, you people have been called out of the world and given the privilege to be ambassadors for him. He doesn't call everybody. He calls a minority. And we are blessed that we are in the minority in the world. That is called out of the world to be his followers. Now godliness is when you have God at the center of your thoughts. And godliness involves a relationship with God. It's not a phase that we go through. It is a everyday relationship with God. Now the godly man or the godly woman focus. They focus upon the majesty 
and the holiness of God. They are aware every day of the majesty of God and his holiness. Now, let me say this. This may seem harsh. But like Jeremiah said in the Bible, Jeremiah said in the Bible, there's many things I want to say and I'm trying to keep it in, Jeremiah said. But I cannot keep it in. It's a fire burning within me. I have to get the words out. So I have to get these words out. There are some people and they will put their president first or they'll put their government first. They will say, I love the red party. Another might say, I love the yellow party or the red party. And their whole life is focused on politics and on their party. And they are so upset if their candidate does not get elected. And they're waiting for the next five years when their candidate gets elected. So they can say, hallelujah, my candidate is in power. And their whole life is focused on their party. All they talk about is the party. They are slaves to the party. But the Christian says, away with that. I am a child of God. God number one family number two, and then maybe, maybe the government number three, but never, ever number one. God won in all things. That is what being godly is. You get your priorities right. God, God in your family, raising up your children in godly ways and sending them out into the world as godly people to continue the godly line of Christianity. Because there are Christians that mix, they mix up in the pot their politics with their Christianity. They have one foot in the camp of the church and they have another foot in the camp of politics and worldly things. And we say, away with you. Christians don't do that. We are focused only on godly things and on Christ. He is our King of kings, our Lord of lords. So even if the president was here in this church this morning, I would say the very same words. Mr. President, I'm sorry to say you come at best third in our list of priorities. Now, Talking about glorifying God. The angels in heaven glorify him. Every millisecond. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. Singing around his throne day and night. Forever and ever and ever. And John in the book of Revelation. When the Lamb of God Jesus said. John write these things down. When John was in front of the Lamb. He fell down. He fell down in worship and in terror at the sight of the Lamb of God. You see, godly, godliness, a reverence, a reverence for holiness like the angels, like John, like Isaiah. Isaiah, the great prophet, he said, oh, woe unto me, woe unto me when he got a glimpse of God. Woe unto me, I'm done, I'm done. Because he knew that he was a sinner in the presence of the Almighty God, getting a glimpse of God, and he said, I'm undone. I'm undone. I'm a sinner in the presence of God. He didn't say, Wow, this is beautiful. No. These people who had a strong connection to God, they feared God, they glorified God. And we, say, we see in the book of Revelation, Revelation 15, verse 3 and 4, where the saints in heaven, they glorify God. Now, a godly person has a continual sense of God's presence in their lives. And this, as I said, this 
godliness is it's not just a warm affection it's more than just having a warm affection it is an active thing you're involved in the church the godly person is always involved you might say well i'm no good i cannot do anything no in the book of corinthians every single christian is given a spiritual gift we know that and we cannot say well your gift is better than mine no all of us are given a spiritual gift and in the eyes of god each of you that has a spiritual gift in the eyes of god your gift is worthy in the eyes of god whether you're singing in the church or preaching or teaching or collecting money for the church or organizing events for the church or bringing people to the church in your motor car everything you do is a spiritual gift given to you by god and you are to use it you are to be active a godly man is not passive he doesn't just say well i know the scriptures and he sits back no he is active he's doing something for god's church and paul says in philippians 3 verse 10 i want to know christ simple but very powerful Godliness is when you accept Christ and you forsake the world. You are a godly man. You are walking in godliness. And godliness is based on God's word. How can I be godly? You go to the Bible. You study it. You familiarize yourself with it in order that you can defend it you cannot defend it if you don't know it now martin luther who lived in germany the german monk who was a roman catholic and then he went away from the roman catholic church martin luther said that we are to live our lives in the image of of God we were made in the image of God so we live our life in the image of God there's no point in saying I know I'm in the image of God and that's wonderful and then you don't live your life in the image of God so you have to say in your daily life when it comes to certain decisions in your life how would Jesus have reacted to this what would Jesus say in this situation how would Jesus defend the Bible? Always we compare ourselves to Christ because we're walking the path of Christ. Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not depend on your own understanding. You see, the world depends on their understanding. They say, well, our government said, this senator said, the, the, science, the scientist said, or this philosopher said, we're not interested in what they say. We're interested only what did God say. So when somebody out there, as they sometimes do, say to me, but, you know, Mr. Fleming, this senator said this, or this philosopher said this or my professor in university said this i say well if that's the case let's go to the bible to see what god said about that situation and if god said differently to that situation then i don't believe what you said simple simple to the point argument with them always we bring them to the bible the godly man always refers them to the Bible. You said that, but God said this. Now, we're concentrating on what Timothy said about Timothy. I want you to be an excellent servant. Verse 6, an excellent service. Now, notice he didn't say, Timothy, I want you to be a servant. Or I want you to be a good servant. He said, Timothy, I want you to be an excellent servant 
the highest level of servant, excellent. In the Roman Catholic Church, we have different levels. We have the priest, the parish priest, then we have the bishop, then the archbishop, then the cardinal, and then the pope. So Paul is saying to Timothy, there is a servant, there can be a good servant, and then you can be an excellent servant. And he says to Timothy, Timothy, I know, I know that you are an excellent servant because I know you, I've been with you on our travels. So he says, I want you to continue to be an excellent servant. And we too should try to attain that level of being an excellent servant rather than just saying well i'm in a comfort zone i'm a servant no try to be an excellent servant of god by doing what pleases god and we're going to come to the things what are these things that pleases god what are they what must i do so here's the things a list of six or seven things that we must do to please god now, you can write them down if you want. So I'll talk slowly. I'll talk in slow motion for those of you who might want to write things down. Here's six or seven things you can do to please God. Because like Enoch, we want to walk with God and please God. We want to be an excellent servant for God. One, study the Bible. Now, I didn't say read it because most Christians, they just scan it, flick through the pages quickly, Study the Bible. Every day spend a half an hour or an hour studying the Bible. Forget your TV5 and vice Gande and all this stupidity and foolishness that's dulling our brains. And study God's word. Number one. Number two. Defend the Bible. Because it's no good to say, I know it, I'm an expert in it, but don't ask me to defend it because I don't want to offend anybody. The excellent servant of God says, I know it, and now that I know it, I am going to defend it. Just as the LGBTQ movement are so vocal in their marches in the streets, and so they call themselves pride, the pride march. Well, we have news for them. We are proud to be Christian warriors for Christ. And we are prepared to defend God's word against the heathen. Number three, repentance of your sin. Don't say, well, maybe I'll repent tomorrow. Because you may die tonight. God said in the Bible, I may come to claim your soul this very night. So don't put it on the long finger. If you have a sin and you're aware of it, don't say it's only a little sin. It's still a sin. You've still transgressed against God. So go to perhaps privately to your room and repent of that sin. Four, strong faith. Strong faith. Five, prayer, prayer life. Be a prayer warrior. Make it a habit that you pray. Just as you eat every day, Filipinos love to eat. We all know that, Sarapnito. Masarap, Filipinos love to eat. They're always having snacks. Not like in Ireland, my country, we only eat three times a day. But in the Philippines, people love their food. Always snacks. Every two hours, they want snacks. They want to nourish themselves. Brother Dan, my wife always, do you want more soup? Do you want more soup? No, my head. So, just as Filipinos love to eat, 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 we need to have this prayer, prayer, prayer. Prayer, prayer, prayer. Just as you love to nourish yourself, Nourish yourself on prayer. So we said study of the Bible. Defend the Bible. Repent of your sins. Pray. Have strong faith. And have fellowship with 
other Christians. It can be in the church. It might be within your family, your relatives, in your community. Have fellowship. Now, they are some of the things that godly people do. A person of godliness will automatically do those things. They are just standard things to do. Another one is, I'll add this to the list, be humble. The godly person is always a humble person. They're not a person of pride. They are the opposite of pride. The real godly person, a person who walks with God, is very aware that they must be humble in all situations. And the godly man will raise up his family in a godly manner. Now, when Paul is writing to Timothy, Timothy is what they call at that time a deacon. Now, we hear that word today, people use the word deacon. It's the same as a pastor. So, Timothy is a deacon in the church at that time. He's a, a pastor. And these deacons are pastors. They are evaluated in the eyes of God more strongly than the ordinary member. Why? Because they have a position of leadership in the church, of authority. So God will evaluate them more. And so Paul is saying to Timothy, Timothy, now remember, you're a deacon, so you be godly. You live a life of godliness because you know your position. That come the day of judgment, you're going to be evaluated more in the eyes of God because God gave you a position of authority and leadership over the sheep in the church. He will be evaluated on his reputation, his private life, and his teaching. Now, just very briefly to say that it's sad today that we see many of the pastors in Europe and in America and in Africa that are not loyal to the word of God. They add things to the scripture that's not there, and they take things out of the scripture that they don't like. They are not faithful pastors. And their lifestyle is most regrettable. With their mistresses, their huge bank accounts, their security, their swimming pools, their private jets. So, Timothy, Paul is saying, you be careful of your private life, Timothy. You're to be a godly man, a man of godliness, and you be careful of your private life because you're going to be evaluated by God more than the others in the church. And it's sad to say because I keep a great interest in what's happening in America, and there's nothing but scandal after scandal in the church in America. It's so hard to defend Christianity today when people say, well, Mr. Fleming, you're talking about Christ and Christians, and I see in America that pastor has a mistress, and the revenue commissioners are investigating him because of his fraud and his bank account. So hard to defend Christianity because of these pastors who are trampling God's church into the ground. So that's why he's saying to Timothy, verse 6, train yourself up in verse 7. Timothy, train yourself up to be a godly person. Now, you see that word train. Why did Paul, Paul is always using certain words, like be a warrior and train yourself up. The reason Paul used that word, Timothy, train yourself up in godliness, is because at that time, 2,000 years ago, when Paul is walking around, he's in Turkey, he's in Greece, particularly in Greece, at that time, the Greeks are very big into physical exercise. They're very big into athletics. Now, you all know about the Olympics. The Filipinos might have a boxer, who is going to the Olympics or the swimmer, and you hope that you're going to win a medal, that the Filipino will win a medal. I think you had a Filipina boxer. I think she won a medal. Yeah, she won a medal in the Olympics. Now, Paul sees these Greeks, and they're always running, always involved in athletics, and he observes all this. 
and he sees them that they're very disciplined, they're very focused, and they go to the gymnasium, what we call the gymnasium, they have a type of gymnasium, a building, and they're doing weightlifting, and they're obsessed with taking care of their body. And Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, you're to train yourself up. But here's the difference, Timothy. He says, that type of life, Timothy, of training, he says, is good. You see there, verse 7. He says, it's good. Nothing wrong with that, to have a healthy body. It's good. And to have exercise, he said, Timothy, is good. And to go jogging is good, like our sister, Ju what's her name, that lady? The Hmm? Nancy Giuliano. You see, Nancy Giuliano, our sister in Christ, if you see Nancy on Facebook, every day Nancy is out jogging. Super good. She takes care of the body. She's super fit. She's healthy. Now, Paul makes the comparison. He said, but Timothy, training is good, he said, for the body. But I want you to train up in godliness. And he said, the reason being that your body someday is going to die. So this powerful body, like we see in America, the movie actor Schwarzenegger, and that guy in Rambo, Sylvester Stallone, these movie stars, powerful bodies that are the envy of many people. He said, that body is going to die. And it's going to rot in the grave. So all that workout and fitness someday is no good. You're lying in the grave and your body is rotten. But he said, if you train up in godliness, that godliness is for eternity. Your soul is going to be in heaven eternity with the body, united with the body, the soul and the body united in eternity. So train up for godliness. Do your physical exercise, Timothy. Good. We all like to have healthy people coming to our church. But he said, train up more in godliness because the body is going to die and all that physical exercise is for nothing because when they put you into the grave, what good is it? But he said, if you train up in godliness, the godliness is for eternity. The body is only for when you're on this earth. Now, I'm going back to these false pastors. Now, you have to understand in verse 6, 7, and 8 why he's sending this letter to Timothy. And you have to go back to verses 1 and 5 in 1 Timothy 4 to know why is Paul suddenly concerned that he has to write this letter to Timothy. And the clue is you go back to verses 1 and 5 and you find in verses 1 and 5 where Paul has seen false teachers in Ephesus. And now he's warning Timothy in verses 6, 7, and 8, he's saying that, Timothy, you have to stand by the truth. You have to stand by sound doctrine. Why? Because in Ephesus, there are false teachers with their false doctrine and their heresy. And I am concerned, Timothy, that they're going to eventually come into your area into your houses where you're having fellowship and they're going to bring their false ideas and as he says there, their old wives' tales. In some of your Bibles there, you'll see the wording, old wives' tales. What is old wives' tales? It's foolish talk, it's superstition, it's heresy. And he said, Timothy, don't get involved with these people. Don't let them in to your fellowship. You stand firm in the word of God. And don't allow the old, old wife's tales into this church. Now I'm going to give some examples later about these old wife's tales. Because we have religions today. The Mormons. Seventh-day Adventists. Jehovah Witness. INC. And they have what we call old wives' tales, which is foolishness and silliness. They change what's in the Bible and they give, they give their own opinion. Even though God said this, they said, yeah, but this is our idea. And they want to impose their idea on what God said. And Paul is saying to Timothy there, be careful of old wives' tales. Don't listen to them. 
Now, I said that, Timothy, you're going to be evaluated. And the pastors today, all over the world, are going to be evaluated. Now, sometimes we might look at a pastor and we say, oh, that pastor must be wonderful because he's famous. And he's written a best-selling book. And because he's on radio and TV, and we tend to be influenced because of that. But Paul is saying, be wary of that. Because many pastors who write books today, best-selling books in the bookstore, what's in the book is false. And you know my feeling about Benny Hinn and Joel Osteen and Kenneth Copeland and Joyce Mayer and Creflo Dollar and T.D. Jakes. These are just some of the false pastors, but they have huge mega church. A mega church is 2,000 people, 3,000 people, 4,000 people to have these mega churches because they're able to cast a spell over the people in the church and give them false doctrine. And Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, you don't get caught up in that. You stand firm in the doctrine that God has given to you. Remember in the Bible, Jesus took the whip when he saw them outside the temple selling. And Jesus took a whip to them. So I think some of these pastors are lucky that nobody in their church takes a whip to them. Now, a servant must be a noble person. That is nothing in your life are you doing that brings your church and God into condemnation as some of them are doing today they're bringing the church into condemnation so Timothy you don't do that you stand firm Timothy your responsibility is to serve and not to be served now a pastor remember Timothy is a deacon he's a pastor Timothy, you are to serve and don't get full of pride and wanting people to serve you like you are a god on earth. So a pastor, a leader, has to serve and not get carried away in thinking, wow, everybody loves me and because I wrote a book and I'm on TV that the people have to serve me and bow down to me. No, you are a servant just like the rest of us. And pastors don't own the church. The church belongs to God. Because some pastors in the cults, you know the cults, I've mentioned them, Jehovah's Witness, Mormons, Seventh-day Adventists, INC, they are what known as cults. And the hallmark of a cult, the identifying mark of a cult, is all of them have a leader who controls the people. They are in total control of their people. The people have to do what they're told by the leader. If they don't, they're thrown out. Their family are humiliated. They're told that if we throw you out, it'll go very bad for you and your family. This is the hallmark of a cult. Their leader has absolute authority over them. That is not permissible in a godly church. The pastor serves, not you must serve me. Jesus was a servant. He said, I have humbled myself. I have become a lowly servant to do the will of my father. So if we're to follow in the footsteps of Christ, in the image of Christ, then we are to be like Christ, a lowly servant humble servant for his church and not to say look at me i am the head of this church now timothy you are to show leadership pastors in the church deacons and all of us are to show leadership in one way or the other maybe you are in charge of the children teaching the children maybe you're in charge of the music ministry maybe you're the pastor Maybe you're the one to organize them to come to church. Maybe you are the one in leadership where 
you organize the fellowship on a Wednesday night in somebody's house. So you are to take that leadership position and use it properly and be the hallmark of a good leader in your spiritual gift and not just push it to the side and say it's no big deal. It is a big deal in the eyes of God. Now, the minister or the pastor, again, Timothy, Paul talking to Timothy, is to be excellent in his usefulness to the cause of Christ. A worthy servant should bring honor to the name of Christ. Now, I'm going through a list here of what an excellent servant of God should be. Paul said to Timothy, Timothy, I want you to be an excellent servant. I know, Timothy, that you are already an excellent servant because you're my friend, I know you, but continue to be an excellent servant. So here are some of the hallmarks of being an excellent servant. A worthy servant brings honor to the name of Christ. A worthy servant or excellent servant of Christ will be a faithful spiritual leader. A worthy servant wishes to maintain a high standard in his life and in his church. A good servant, again, same thing, a good servant, a faithful servant, an excellent servant, defends the truth against false doctrine. A good servant lives the Christian life. He doesn't just talk it at the pulpit. He lives it. Because people want to see evidence. Your neighbors, your family, they want to see evidence. This guy talks the talk, but does he walk the walk? Is there evidence in his life that he is a godly man? Well, no. I heard he goes gambling. I heard he's beating his wife. I heard he goes to brothels. I heard he goes to massage parlors. There's got to be evidence in your life that you are maintaining a high moral standard in the church and outside of the church when you think that nobody sees you. Now, a worthy servant will have standards in virtue in conduct, in devotion, and in faith. Now, you see all these things, it's not easy. I'm showing you it's not easy to live a godly life, to be a godly person, to be a man of godliness. All of these things, strong faith, good conduct, it's a constant battle. But you have Christ helping you. Christ doesn't leave you alone. He's there helping you, and the Holy Spirit is helping you. So don't say, well, this is too difficult. I can't do it. Look at all these things I have to do. No. God is there helping you. If he wants you to do his work, he'll be there to help you in doing that work. Now, the good minister, he will have a very positive attitude. He won't come into the church negative, negative, and having fellowship be negative. A positive attitude is what you want from your leaders. Because you need to be inspired by them. Now, a worthy servant will warn his people of error. Like Paul is doing to Timothy. T Timothy, I'm warning you now in this pastoral letter. Be careful, they're coming. The false teachers are coming. So a good pastor, a good minister, a good uh, leader in the church, they will constantly be warning the church about error. They will be telling you about the falsehood that's out there. They will name the churches. They will name the pastors. They will tell you what the false teaching is. So you are aware that if they come knocking on your door, they say, hi, we're the Jehovah's Witnesses. You'll say, come on in. I have something to tell you. You'll be ready for the confrontation. You'll be ready for the battle because your pastor told you about the errors in their church. So when they knock on your door, you'll be happy to invite them in so you can convert them because you know they're in error and you know what their errors are. So you're ready for the spiritual battle because you've been raised up by your pastor in the church to know the errors that are out there, that are being promoted out there. 
When they say we're the only true church, like INC, Jehovah Witness, they tell you we're the only true church. Salvation lies only through our church. You know that's an error. You know it's an error. Because you're trained up in the word of God. Now, verse 6, we go back to verse 6. When Paul says these things, these things, he says to Timothy, what are these things? Well, the, these things are false teaching. Timothy, beware of these things. Meaning, Timothy, beware of false teaching and false pastors and false doctrines and deception. Now, a worthy minister will warn his people. He will keep them grounded and rooted in the word of God. Now, an excellent servant of God will be on guard against error, trying to infiltrate the church. Now, we have all these occult ideas coming into the church, and we have the prosperity gospel. Now, you all heard of the prosperity gospel, that you can get rich. God loves you, and if you pray for prosperity and money, you'll get it. Deceitful, deception, lie. God said, you will suffer in my name. Christ said, you will suffer for my name's sake. You want to follow me? Then Christ said, you'll suffer. If you follow me, you're going to suffer because the world hates you. The prosperity gospel preacher comes to the altar and he said, if you come to Christ, you'll prosper. You will have lots of money. Just pray for it. Error, deception. You look around the world and you see Christians, are they all, are they all wealthy and healthy? No. Many of them have health problems and they're poor. Most Filipinos, from what I read, 90% of Filipinos are poor. So what happened? Aren't they praying for, the, for prosperity? Yeah. No, why, are, why isn't the money falling down from heaven? Deception. Now, a good servant of God must establish strong theology, strong doctrine, and accountability. The pastor is accountable to the church and to God. The people in the church are accountable also. They've got to be disciplined. If they're not disciplined, pastor has to call them in, into the room with the elders, and sit down and say, we have a problem here that needs to be sorted out. That's what a godly man is, who's living a life of godliness. If he sees indiscipline in the church, he calls the person in or that family and he says, we need to talk. We have a problem. He doesn't say, oh, I can't say that because I might offend their feelings. He's there to save their soul. How can he save their soul and raise them up strong in the faith if every time he sees wrongdoing in the church, he says, I don't want to get involved. Then he's a weak leader and we don't want weak leaders in the church christ wants strong leaders so a strong leader in the church like timothy has to even rebuke his own members if the need arises so they will be better christians in the long run now a good servant he needs to be able to interpret scripture and how do you do that? By studying it. And if you're not sure about a certain passage, you go to your pastor. Pastor, there's a passage here. I don't understand it. Can you explain it to me? Now, the issue is not how good a communicator you are, because many pastors are very good communicators. The issue is how well do you know the word of God? You see, back to the false pastors again, the false teachers, Many of them are fantastic communicators. You say, wow, that guy has the gift of talking. He's wonderful. I love to listen to him. Joel Osteen. You listen to Joel Osteen. He can talk, talk, talk. But how well are they versed in the word of God? So don't be influenced by the fact that that pastor has 2,000 in his church because he's a fantastic pastor and they come from all around to hear this pastor. No good if he doesn't know the word of God and is teaching falsehood. No good. Now, the better the learner, then the better the teacher. So you've got to learn it before you can teach it. Now, why should we be a servant of Christ? 
Christ, you want me to be a servant. Why? Why should I be? Because he owns you. You were created by God. Why? What was the purpose, Lord, you created me? See, these are the big questions we've got to ask. So you created me. Okay, what was the purpose you created me for? I'm confused, Lord. I created you to glorify me. Let's make it simple. I love to make things simple for the people in the church. Not talk theology that they said, I don't know what this guy's talking about. God created you. Why? In order that you glorify him. And he owns you because he died on the cross for you. He shed his blood for you. So you're his if you believe in him. You're mine. If you believe me, I've shed my blood for you. You're mine. I own you. I purchase you. Like if I buy a motor car, it's mine. I own it. I purchased it. He purchased, he purchased us with his blood. He owns us. Now because he owns me, I serve him. The president does not own me. The government does not own me. The professor in my college does not own me. Christ owns me. So I serve my commander-in-chief, Christ, because he owns me. Nobody else owns me. Even my wife, and I have these discussions with my wife, that we serve Christ. Now, we follow his word. We do not follow the culture. You see, the youth today in particular are into the culture. What's the fashion? What's the trend? They follow the culture. And whenever they see these pastors dressed up nice in the big car, and they, they say, oh, that pastor, he must, he must be a man of God. He looks good. He talks good. They, they get obsessed with the culture. And whatever the politics, the politicians, when they make a law, well, they say, well, if the politicians made that law that abortion is legal, well, then it must be okay because the politicians signed an executive order. The president signed an executive order, or 1434 to say the abortion is legal. And we say no, because it's offensive to God. If they say that a man can marry a man, a woman can marry a woman, we say no, even if it's a, your executive order, because it's offensive in the sight of God. So we follow his word. We don't follow the culture. The culture said that I can marry another man. I don't care what the culture said. We're Christians. We fly the Christian flag over our house. We, we fly the cross of Christ over our house and over our church. We don't follow the culture, the thinking of the culture. Because you hear today people say, well, the LGBT movement, the LGBTQ movement, it, it must be okay because, you know, the politicians are okaying it. Like in my country now, we have divorce. We have same-sex marriage. We have abortion up to 12 weeks. And the Irish people would say, well, it must be okay because the government said it. But God also said it's wrong. And we follow God. Now, if we're a godly person, we mourn with those who mourn. We don't say, well, somebody in the church has a problem and they're going through a terrible time of suffering. Well, that's their problem. I only see them on a Sunday. No, we mourn when they mourn. They have problems. Their problem is our problem. We're there for them. We encourage them. If they're sick, we try to visit them in their home or in the hospital. If they're in prison, we try to go there. We mourn when they mourn. That's what a godly man and godliness is. Not to say, well, I don't really know them. I only see them on a Sunday. No. We, we, we are joyful when they're joyful. And we mourn when they mourn. Because we're all one family. Now, that's a lovely word to use. But in most churches, they don't really have a sense of family. They just say, yeah, yeah, I know we're, we're all family. But in reality, you, we don't see it. We just don't see it. We don't see the evidence. That all the people in the church are, we're all connected. We're texting each other and phoning each other and visiting each other. That's the way it should be. But sad to say, it doesn't happen. So if we're going to say we're family, then let us prove it. Let us see the evidence that we're godly people. We're walking in godliness and we're one big family and we're all connected and we love to be connected. And, and the church is our life. The church is our life. Not to just say, well, only on a Sunday, but I don't even know his name. Now, a good servant of God is not influenced by godless ideas. 
that contradict the word of God. A faithful servant of God, he refused to listen to the old wife's tales. Now, a faithful servant, he must have a pure mind. Not a mind that accepts foolish and shallow and ignorant fantasies. And truth is based on biblical certainties, not on some theories that somebody has. But on certainty, not on theories. Because people have their theories. Well, I think this and I think that. We're not just in what you think. We have certainty here in the Bible. We are not to be influenced by modern day scholars and intellectuals, but by the word of God. Now you see verse 7, it said, train yourself to be godly. Godly men are spiritual men who are using spiritual methods. A godly life is a life of reverence and virtue and holiness that nourishes your soul. We don't be just nourishing our mouth all the time, going to Jollibee, McDonald's, nourishing our mouth. You are to nourish your soul. Your soul is more important than the body. We are to train for godliness. Now, the longing for holiness and the pursuing of holiness, rather than being preoccupied with your looks and your material possessions, the godly man is not interested in how I look in the mirror and his, his nice clothes and his, look at my big car, my two-liter car, my five-bedroom house. The people in Portofino, you know, I asked uh, the security in Portofino, how much are those houses? He said, well, sir, the cheapest house here, if you want to buy one, is 50 million. That's the cheapest. But you can buy one for 100 million, sir. I said to him, well, um, <laughs> nice to look at them. So you see, the man of God, he's not interested in all that. I'm from Portofino. Look at my address, Portofino. Who cares? You'll be dead in 20 years. You'll be rotting in the grave. We don't care. Training for godliness means serving the will of God. I don't serve the will of people, what the people want outside. The people want, I don't care. I serve the will of God. Now, a worthy servant often has to endure hardship as a good soldier of Christ. Remember, Paul always talks about soldiers and warfare. We are in a spiritual warfare. We are soldiers. We are fighting on the side of God against the world. And so, a worthy servant will often have to endure hardship. The media are not going to like you. Your neighbor may not like you. Some in your family who are Roman Catholic will not like you. You're going to meet opposition as a servant of God and be prepared for it. Know it. Be aware of it because you're going to meet it. The more you speak out, the more you go on radio or TV, the more you go around the Philippines speaking the word of God, you are going to meet hostility as a servant of God. They are going to come out of the woodwork. They are going to oppose you. It may mean physical. In some cases, they may physically try to hurt you. In other cases, they will try to put you down, destroy your reputation, try to make you look foolish and stupid. You don't believe in that, do you? That's just a book like every other book. No, it's a supernatural book. That book has been under attack for 2,000 years and it still survived to this day. How can that be? Because it's a supernatural book. Now, you train yourself. Paul, talking to Timothy, Timothy, train yourself up. You train yourself so you do not get caught up with the ways of this world and the ways of this life. Now, I want to say, you can write this down if you want. I'll talk slowly now. Godliness is a lifestyle. I'm going to say that again because you might have a bar you might want to write it down so you remember it. What is godliness? Godliness is a lifestyle. You are living a lifestyle. Now, everybody has a lifestyle, right? But godliness is a lifestyle that is lived in conformity to the will 
of God. Now there you have it. Godliness it's a lifestyle that you're living because everybody has a lifestyle. The guy outside who's non-Christian, he has his own lifestyle. So it's a lifestyle that is lived in conformity to the will of God. Now training for Godliness is profit for all things, for spiritual things. Now, an excellent minister, he's committed to hard work. Being a servant of God is not easy. It's hard work. He endures life's struggles. Did you know that John Calvin, the great preacher, 500 years ago in the city of Geneva in Switzerland, he would do a sermon five times every week. Now, today, a pastor will do a sermon normally once on a, fri on a Sunday morning. John Calvin, one of the greatest Christians who ever lived, did five sermons every week. You see, hard work, men of God, godly. They have this desire to get the word out, get it out. I cannot hold it in, like Jeremiah. I've got to get the word out. And Paul said, I believe in God, so I spoke. He couldn't hold the words in, Paul. He traveled all to these countries because I believe in God, therefore I speak. God be with the days of Charles Spurgeon in England when Charles would talk for three hours, but now I'm limited to 50 minutes to one hour. But I long to, for those days that if I was living back in the 1800s in the UK, I could speak to 100,000 people. Did you know that Charles Spurgeon, they call him the... Uh, the prince of preachers. He is regarded by many as the greatest preacher of all time who ever lived. And he was a Baptist. And he was known to preach to, take a deep breath now, he was, he was known to preach to 100,000 people out in the field on a Sunday morning. And sometimes it would be raining heavy and they would be, the mud, the mud would be up to here. And none of them would leave the field. You think, oh, we have to run, it's raining. No. They were so entranced, taken in by the words of Charles Spurgeon, that not one person would leave. 100,000. And he would preach for two hours and sometimes three hours. Now today, sadly, if a pastor tries to speak for more than 50 minutes or an hour, they'll get sleepy, their mind will wander, they want to go home. You see how we have fallen. Do you see how the church has fallen today? Oh, I won't go to that church. Why not? Because there's a pastor there and he'll speak for maybe an hour or an hour and a half. Oh, I don't want to go there. But this guy speaks for 30 minutes. I'll go there so I can run home to have my adobo. But you'll be dead soon. Now, I wish we had the Charles Spurgeon here in Tunisan. Now, the servants of God, I have only maybe five minutes. The servants of God understand that they are involved in the saving, redemptive history unfolding from our sovereign God. So the man of God, the godly man, who walks like Enoch, walks with God, he is very aware, you don't have to tell him, he's aware that he is part of, of redemptive history, that his job is to redeem souls, to redeem the unbeliever, to convert them. He is very aware of that. He is part of redemptive history, that he's to win souls for God. And there's no more important or glorious work than adding souls to God's kingdom on earth. The servant of God, he keeps teaching things related to divine truth and virtue. Now, the excellent minister of God, he commands people to repent. And to believe the gospel and to bow the knee to the authority of the word of God. Talking here about excellent now, excellent servants, this is what they have to do. Now, a worthy servant is a person who preaches what they live. And a servant of Christ is expected to be able to explain the scriptures. Now, in 1 Timothy 5, it says, Elders, do your work well, especially 
work hard at teaching and preaching. And the Bible says, do not neglect the spiritual gift within you. God has given you that gift. Do not neglect it. Did you know my favorite pastor is John MacArthur in America? He's a Baptist. His father, I read this recently, John MacArthur's father was preaching until the age of 91. Hallelujah. A man of God. He didn't say, oh, I'm 65, I'll just sit at home now and watch TV5 and my preaching is done. No. He's still coming to the altar as a pastor, preaching at 91 years of age. And he was preaching up to six months before he died. What a wonderful servant of God John MacArthur's father was. He was passionate about his work. It was his life. It's not just a job. A servant of God, it is your very life. Like the guy who loves to play basketball four times a week. He loves to go to the basketball court. That's his life. He wants to go higher. He wants to get better in basketball. This is our life. It's what we love. It's teaching, preaching, and defending the word of God. Because we are servants of God. Now let people see the evidence in your life. Now an excellent servant, and this is important, will admit when they have made error. So if I teach something and I realize it's not true, I said something that's not true, an excellent servant will not be full of pride. He will come back to the church and he say, you know what, I said this to you, but I made an error. He will humble himself. So always humble ourselves because some pastors, they might think, oh, I cannot admit that I made an error. I'm a pastor. No. If you're an excellent servant, you will admit it, that you made an error in your teaching or your preaching. And it's okay, and the church will think more highly of you because you humbled yourself. Now, so you put aside your pride, and your faithfulness will be the instrument with God that God will use to save others. Your faith, God will use your faith as an instrument for you to save others. And you, you must persevere in the church and in your Christian walk because you're going to be confronted by the world outside. So persevere, endure. It's a life of endurance. Now, we always must maintain a biblical worldview and not the view of the world outside. Always look at it this way. If you are a faithful servant of God, an excellent servant of God, let them say, when you are dead and in the grave, let them say that this man or woman was an excellent servant of God. What a tremendous honor that is. If in later years when you're dead, you're in the grave for 10 years and somebody goes by your grave, a relative or a friend or a neighbor and said, you know what, that man or woman in that grave was an excellent servant of God. That is a great honor if people can say that about you. And every servant is an ambassador for Christ. Not just the pastor, not just the elders, but every single person in the church has a responsibility to be an ambassador for Christ. So don't have the alibi to say, well, I'm not an elder, I'm not a pastor, so I don't really have to do anything. No, that's a mistake. That's an alibi. You are an ambassador for Christ's church and his word. And be on guard against corrupt practices in the church. If you are an excellent servant, you will cut out any corrupt practice that you see in the church. Now, I'm going to finish here. I want to tell you about when Paul said about old wives' tales, right? Old wives' tales. People will bring the old wives' tales into our church, like the INC and all these people and the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons. And they'll come in here and they'll say something that if you know the Bible, you'd say, that's foolish, that's stupid. There's a guy in America, he's a, he's a pastor, he's a leader of a church, and he's dead now. Now listen to this, because Paul is warning Timothy, Timothy, old wives' tales, be careful, don't let him into the church. In America, all these strange things always happen in America. 
What this is about America. Filipinos love America. They want to go and work in America. But America is a God-forsaken country. All these crazy people in the church are in America. This guy in America, because I study these things. Listen to this. He said that his church actually called Heaven's Gate Church. And it's Heaven's Gate and his church was 1976 to 1977. And I'll just get straight to the point. He said to the people in the church, he said, the body uh, is irrelevant, right? The body is irrelevant, it's only the soul. So he said, there's no point in really living on this earth because uh, the body is just going to rot and all of that. And he said that there's no point in taking medicine. He said, don't take medicine. No need to take medicine. If you're sick, you're ill. He said, no need to take medicine because he said, Christ is the healer. So all you've got to do is whenever you're sick, even if you're seriously ill, just pray to Jesus Christ to heal me. Now that sounds wonderful and it's true to an extent. We do pray to Jesus to heal us. But there's sometimes you have to be realistic and you've got to go to a doctor or you've got to go to your surgeon. If I have a heart problem, I've got to go to my surgeon. Even though I'll pray to God first, but I still got to, because God has created surgeons for us to use. God has created architects and engineers. He's created the builder to build our house. So God creates people on the earth, and he creates uh, professions. He gives us surgeons, he gives us doctors to use them. And so this guy in this church, Heaven's Gate, said, no need to use medicine. And so some of them died in the church because they had serious issues and they wouldn't use medicine. Now we come to an even more worrying aspect. This same guy, the leader in the church, said it. He said, now he said, you know what? We all have to commit suicide. Now, you would think if my pastor said we have to commit suicide today, we'd all run out, right? We'd all run. But they said it okay. And to make this story short, 39 people in his church committed suicide with their pastor. And the reason they committed suicide, because he explained to them before, that when we commit suicide, listen to this now, for the old wives' tales, the stupidity and the silliness, and they believed it. Because Paul is warning Timothy, if they commit to the church with this silliness, don't accept it. He said that, that when we commit suicide, there is a UFO. You know what the UFO is? There's a UFO going to come immediately we commit suicide because our soul is going to leave the body. Now, he's correct that the soul does leave the body. When the doctor said, Mr. Dennis Fleming is dead, when the doctor pronounces me dead, that my heart is not beating and the blood is not flowing, at that moment I'm dead, the soul immediately leaves my body. That's true. But he said that when the soul leaves the body, immediately a UFO is going to come the souls are going to go into that UFO, they'll be re reunited with the body, and then that UFO is going to take them to heaven. And they said, wow, let's go ahead and commit suicide so we can be with the Lord now. And they went ahead, 39 of them with their pastor, and committed suicide. You see, old waves tale, misleading the people in the church. Now, uh, the other guy who said don't take medicine, he was 1963 to 1984, his church, and he was in the Faith Assembly Church, a guy called Hobart Freeman. And this Faith Assembly Church, he's the guy that said don't take medicine. He actually died of diabetes. Imagine, the guy that said don't take medicine, no need, pray to God, God will heal you. He himself died of diabetes. Because you see that the stupidity of these people, leading their people astray. Now, Hobart believed in the atonement of Christ that Christ's blood on the cross will heal you. So no need to go to a doctor. And then he himself dies of diabetes. You see the stupidity, leading their people astray. Okay, and I'm going to finish now that... Again, just to recap... We are to be godly people, like Timothy. Now, Timothy, remember, he was brought up strong in the faith. Just very quick background to Timothy. He was 35 years to 38. 
Timothy was a godly man. Why? Because his mother, Louis, or Lois, L-O-I-S, brought him up strong in the faith. You see that? The family line. And his grandmother, Eunice, brought him up strong in the faith. So when Timothy was a little boy, he had the mother and the grandmother every day teaching him, teaching him, teaching him. That's why Paul was able to say to Timothy, Timothy, I know that you are a faithful servant. I know it because I know your mother, Lois, and your grandmother, Eunice, has brought you up strong in the faith. And, and I want you to continue now to be an excellent servant for God. And be careful of these false doctrines and false pastors. So, to finish our sermon today... I hope this is inspiring that we will go forth today to be the godly people, to live a life, a lifestyle of godliness. And remember, we said some of the seven things that to live this life of godliness from today onwards, we study the Bible. When we know it, we defend it. We repent. We have a prayer life. We have fellowship with other Christians. We have strong faith. We humble ourselves. That is the evidence of a godly person. So I'm hoping that from today onwards, we will be, as a church, inspired to say, okay, maybe up to today, I'm not living the godly life that I wanted. Maybe I'm falling down on some of those things that I should do. But I'm going to make a vow before God today. I'm going to try hard to live a godly life, a life of godliness like Enoch. From today, I want to walk with God. I want to please God. That on the day of judgment, when we stand before God, he will say these great words to us, well done, my faithful servant. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the great blessing of the sermon today. We thank you for blessing us with our health to be able to even come here today, Father God. We think of all those who are sick today, who are in a hospital bed, Perhaps they're at home with some physical ailment for the God. So we thank you that you have blessed us with this strong health that we're able to come to your church here today, your house for the God, to preach your word. And Father God, may you bless us all here in this church that we can go forth today to be godly, to live a lifestyle of godliness that is pleasing to you that we will be prepared to defend your word against the world outside, Father God. That we will have strong faith, that we will be good ambassadors for your church wherever we go, Father God. That we will desire you, we will fear you, we will love you. Because we want to hear those wonderful words from you, that we were the good and faithful servants that we did what you wanted us to do, that, we're, that we were spiritual warriors for you, Father God, that we didn't keep our heads down, that we spoke out loud and clear your word to whoever would listen, to convert them, and those who are already converted, to raise them stronger in the faith, Father God. And we ask, Father God, that this church will be mightily blessed by you, that we can all be, like Timothy, excellent servants for you, Father God. And in Jesus' name we pray for this great blessing. Amen.